to welcome you all to the Langley Adams Library here in Groveland. Tonight we're going to see Ann Barrett from Topsfield who's going to talk to us about rounders to baseball, a little history from about 19th century town ball and the history of that until basically today's baseball and a lot of the history in between is a little bit about um, the women's baseball league and the African American league, which probably called something different then. Um, and so I'd like to welcome you and welcome Ann Barrett. Thank you, Diana. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. I'm really happy. It'd be actually it's a great night. We can go out and play baseball yes. ourselves, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> we'll pick up game Diana and I were talking yeah. about beforehand. Well, um, as you can see, we're going to talk about baseball and maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit of sort of emphasis on our favorite team, possibly, although I, I can't assume that it's everybody's favorite team. Mm -hmm. I've been places where it wasn't unanimous, though. And given the fact that uh, our team may not be doing quite so well, I was just wondering, if anybody felt that I should be wearing this instead. Oh, no, no, no. Does anybody want me to put this on? Okay, all right, all right. Well, I just need to, I, this is kind of a litmus test to tell me what kind of a crowd I have. Now you know. <laughs> well, as Mark Twain said, baseball is the very symbol of the drive and push and rush and struggle of the raging, tearing, booming 19th century. For over a hundred years, baseball has been an, in, an integral part of our national identity. People have favorite teams, favorite players, favorite plays, and not, not favorite plays, very, very aggressively not favorite plays, <laughs> that they will share their opinions with uh, quite readily. And many share, uh, many follow avidly the week by week scores and standings. How did our nation become so entwined with baseball? After all, it's a game. It's just a game, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> On Christmas Day in 1621, it's recorded that the game of stool ball was played at Plymouth Plantation. In England, stool ball had been played for quite some time. It threw the sexes together to play this game oftentimes around the Easter holidays, uh, and there was open flirtation and personal liberties and other such. Well, when this was played in 1621, Governor Bradford reported to have found them in ye street at play openly, some at pitching ye bar and some at stool ball and such like sport. He promptly confiscated the implements. Mm -hmm. Such revels were not to be tolerated in Puritan Plymouth. Stool ball, which originated in England, was probably pretty different from baseball. However, it did have fielding and throwing, and there were any number of games that involved a ball, an implement to hit with, sometimes even just your hand, and some sort of running. There are historic references to games such as bat ball, bat and ball, old cat and three baseball and many more um, names, uh, various games with names like that, which all involved some kind of running base and ball kind of activity. I'm going to just turn off the light too, I think. Most cultures have some sort of stick and ball game, um, cricket probably being the one most well known to us. England also had a game called uh, baseball, two words, uh, which involved hitting the ball with your hand. An 18th century diary belonging to William Bray was discovered just recently, actually, in a shed in southern England. And William Bray, in 1755, wrote, went to Stoke Church this morning after dinner, went to Miss Geals to play at baseball with her the three Miss Whiteheads, Miss Billinghurst, Miss Molly Flutter, Mr. Chandler, Mr. Ford, and H. Parsons. Drank tea and stayed until eight. <laughs> Sounds like something from a Jane Austen novel. <laughs> 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 
some historians feel that baseball is based on the English game of rounders. Mm -hmm. In this 1829 edition of the boys' own book, the game's description includes two teams, five bases, a ball, a bat. It refers to striking out and being caught out while moving from um, place to place. And as a matter of fact, the green diagram that you see here uh, lays out kind of what rounders would be like. And the uh, person would hit here, the bat is kind of shorter like this, um, and then run from here to here. And instead of bases, these are posts, but they run around and then they finish here. So instead of coming back here, they finish over here but pretty similar still. And rounders is still played widely in England today. In this country, in the early 19th century, there was a growing popularity of a similar sort of game called variously town ball, or just base, or baseball. Notwithstanding the ties between rounders and baseball, people tend to equate cricket and baseball to some degree as well. And along that line, it's interesting to note that one of the first professional baseball teams, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, was managed by Harry Wright, um, who was the son of an English cricketer who played both sports professionally. Cricket never really caught on in America, and baseball never really caught on in England, and in two uniquely nationalistic commentaries on this point, the Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's son, who would later become Edward VII. After watching an exhibition in London and many um, baseball teams in the later 19th century, American baseball teams, went to England to play um, exhibition games. Well, he saw one in 1889 and said, I consider baseball an excellent game, but cricket a better one. And while visiting London in 1934, Babe Ruth was unimpressed by the wages paid to professional cricketers and considered hitting the ball with cricket's wider, flat-faced bat no challenge at all. The babe was known to have said, sure I could smack that ball all right. How could I help it when you have a great wide board to swing? Throughout the mid part of the 19th century, small towns in the north formed teams and baseball clubs formed in cities baseball became a community and social event. My grandmother described how in the early 1900s a game would be uh, a cause for um, a town-wide turnout and would perhaps be uh, followed by a dance in the evening or other social festivities. Um, as a young woman, for her it would be an opportunity to admire a special player and offer a reason to show off perhaps her new dress. I believe the special player became my grandfather. <laughs> In fact, I know that. Now, for years, Union general and war hero, hero Abner Doubleday was credited with being the father of the modern game, even though nothing in his personal writings supported the story. It turns out that in the early 1900s, when baseball was becoming um, more uh, modern, a commission was uh, created to establish where had baseball come from? What was its provenance? And apparently an elderly Civil War veteran stepped forward with the story, um, and he may have served under Doubleday. He stepped forward with the, uh, declaring that Doubleday had actually organized and trained a team in the 1830s, which would make him the founder of baseball. Subsequent findings say that the commission simply landed upon something that sounded feasible, and oh, that was quick and we're done. Uh, and in fact, that that has no substantiation whatsoever. Uh, and s but still, Cooperstown, uh, where he was reported to have uh, done this, became the home to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. However, his, uh, I was reading that his portrait used to be hanging in that, in the um, Hall of Fame, and I guess it no longer is, so I guess everybody's pretty much washed their hands of that theory and said it really wasn't true. In 1845, Alexander Cartwright wanted to formalize a list of rules by which all teams could play, so that teams could travel from one place to another and be assured that they were all going to be playing by the same set of rules that everyone understood. Much of that original code is still in place today. The first recorded baseball contest after that took place in 1846. 
Cartwright's Knickerbockers lost to the New York Baseball Club in the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey. So, so much for having the advantage of having written the rules, his team still lost. In 1857, a convention of amateur teams was called to discuss rules and regulations. And 25 teams sent from the Northeast sent delegates to this. The following year, they formed the National Association of Baseball Players, the first organized baseball league. In its first year of operation, they sometimes charged admission uh, in order to fund their um, organization. How would you like to be sometimes charged to go to Fenway? It would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> in the years of the Civil War, the number of baseball clubs dropped dramatically, but interest in baseball was carried to other parts of the country with, by Union soldiers. Although Baseball had been, up until that point in time, somewhat popular in uh, cities on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. It had not really gotten its widespread popularity until after the war ended. The mass concentration of young men in both uh, army camps and prisons eventually converted the, for, uh, the sport, which had been considered rather a gentleman's sport, it converted it into a game and a sport that all could enjoy uh, from all backgrounds. The picture that you see here is of a baseball game taking place within an army uh, installation. And officers and enlisted men played side by side. And people earned their place on the team based upon their skill and, not, and, and their athletic talents and not because of their military rank or their social standing. Both Union and Confederate officers encouraged, and, uh, encouraged this kind of activity. It gave the men a much needed break after a lot of, um, it was a morale builder for them. It also was a team builder. Uh, and oftentimes the team building followed onto the battlefield. Many times soldiers would write home and describe these games, um, and so they appear in many soldiers' letters, probably because they were much easier and more pleasant to recall and to tell home about than some of the hardships of battle. Private Alphurus B. Parker of the 10th Massachusetts wrote, the parade ground has been a busy place for a week or so past. Ball playing, having become a mania in camp, Officers and men forget for a time the difference in rank and indulge in the invigorating sport with the enthusiasm of schoolboys. It, it is astonishing how indifferent a person can become to danger, he goes on to write. The report of musketry is heard but very little distance from us. Yet over there on the other side of the road, most of our company playing bat ball and perhaps in less than half an hour, they may be called to play a game of much more serious nature. Sometimes games would be interrupted by the call of battle. George Putnam, a Union soldier, humorously wrote of a game that was called early due to the surprise attack on their camp by Confederate infantry. He went on to write, suddenly there was a scattering of fire, which three outfielders caught the brunt of. The center field was hit and was captured. Left and right field managed to get back to our lines. The attack was repelled without serious difficulty, but we had lost our center field. And not only that, the only baseball in all of Alexandria, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> baseball played during the war was very different than the game we know today. Some rules included the striker or batter could choose where he wanted the pitch to, to come. The pitcher uh, had to throw underhand. Uh, there was no leading off the bag, no base stealing, no foul lines, and all balls were fair. After the war, soldiers return, returned home, bringing their enthusiasm and ideas regarding baseball, and baseball really began to take hold in earnest. Charging admission to games became more common, and teams often had to seek out donations and sponsors to make trips in order for teams to get, just like today, in order for teams to get the financial support they needed, winning became very important. And so although uh, players were supposed to be amateurs, many were secretly paid. And amateur playing was beginning to become a thing of the past. 
to such a degree, actually, that in 1871 there was a split in the um, organization over the question of amateurs versus, versus professionals. Out of this emerged the National Association of Professional Baseball Players. The existing amateur league actually only lasted another couple of years after that. The new league focused on making money. <coughs> and of course, to make money, you have to have a winning team. So teams were constantly trying to woo away players with higher salaries, and, and players were moving from one team to another. It created a great deal of chaos, and the league folded in 1876. However, Chicago White Stocking uh, owner, William Hulbert, pictured here, who was a coal baron, saw an opportunity. And he formed the National League. Uh, and he chose cities where he felt that there were at least 75,000 potential customers um, to come to the games. They included Boston, Cincinnati, Hartford, New York, Philadelphia, uh, and Louisville. He established rules virtually shutting out the lower classes and encouraging middle class attendance. No alcohol, no Sunday games, which precluded the working class from coming because they usually worked on Saturdays, and, no, and a very <coughs> steep ticket price of 50 cents. Boston South End Grounds, which is pictured here, was an example of this new playing arena for the middle class. Uh, there were armchairs for the ladies, there was carriage parking, and there were ladies' day events, which encouraged men to be more choice in their selection of adjectives, <laughs> according to one magazine. <laughs> At the same time, Hulbert also introduced the reserve clause, which dictated that for in every team, five players had to stay with the team and could not um, bounce from team to team. What do you mean by that example? Five, um, because before what had happened was that uh, players were constantly being wooed away by higher salaries, which yeah. created a great deal of chaos. So now five players from every team had to stay with that team. How did they choose the five? Um, they just chose five. whichever randomly, you know, whichever ones perhaps, you know, you're the best, <laughs> or we decided that the you five are the ones that we want to keep. Oh. So you're not allowed to leave. Players didn't have the kinds of rights, you know, I mean, even now, you know, I mean, Kurt certainly get into contracts, but back then, as you will soon see, players had very few rights. In a backlash to this classism, the American Association sprung up, headed in part by four brewmasters. And this league was called, was nicknamed the Beer and Whiskey League. This league allowed Sunday play, served beer, and charged only 25 cents. And not only did they serve beer, but at least one of the brewmasters um, in dictating the building of a new um, stadium insisted that a good portion of the stadium seating be left uncovered and outside, basically baking the patrons so that they would become thirsty and drink uh, even more <laughs> beer. After Hulbert died, Albert Spaulding, who had formerly been a talented pitcher and have, was also the, fall, uh, the um, founder of Spaulding Sporting Goods, took the reins, and Spaulding was even more ruthless. He expanded the reserve clause to all players so that none of the players were allowed to leave. And then on top of that, he introduced a salary cap so the players could only make a certain amount of money and no more. The result of that was very a lot of unhappy players and the startup of the Brotherhood of Professional Baseball Players, which drew some players and backers away from the other league, the, uh, the American Association. Uh, in the end, Spalding, Spalding wanted to crush all of these other leagues, and in the end he was successful because um, one league would pull away from the other league and weaken them both until they both basically disbanded. So by 1892, the National League was back to being the only game in town. Did everything have the same salaries? No. But, but, you, but there was a cap. However, when the National League decided to drop four teams from its membership, 
the Western League, which had been a minor league up until that time, um, declared itself um, another league, another uh, major league, and they picked up those four teams. And basically, they became the, uh, the, American, the American League. They also added, league in, added leagues in some national league cities, including Boston. Um, and uh, they had the, uh, Boston, who had the National um, League Boston Bean Eaters, which were, later became the Boston Braves, now had the Boston Americans as well. The National League obviously fought it at first, but ultimately a three-man commission was put in place to uh, work out how these two leagues could work together and could coexist. And in the end, the National League had to accept the American League. The new Boston team played ball at the Huntington Avenue ground, um, now a part of Northeastern University campus. Pitching legend Cy Young won 33 <coughs> games, putting the team in second place for that season. Prior to the 1903 season, the presidents of the American and National League had sat down and laid out a plan and made an agreement for a postseason series between the champions of the American League and the champions of the National League to settle the world championship. Now, over the years, there had been sporadic uh, world championships. Uh, sometimes when there were multiple leagues, they would be between uh, teams of the different leagues. And other times when there was just one league, it would be between the top two teams of that one league. In this first World Series, Boston faced off against Pittsburgh. And the first game was played at Huntington Avenue, and uh, Cy Young has the honor of pitching out the very first ever uh, World Series pitch. And in a, tech, in a tense competition, it took eight games for Boston to become the first world championship champions over Pittsburgh Pirates. <coughs> and why did they call themselves World when it wasn't the World? They're very American. And still do. Yeah. <laughs> and still do. Well, there's really not a lot of baseball outside of here, so I guess they're pretty safe. Well, but there wasn't then. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I it's... I think it's very American. It is. Yeah. It is. And, and we, we were even more so at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and do I detect an accent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they still don't play. They still don't play baseball over there. Come on. I used to play around it. Aha. Cheering them on with the Royal Rooters, a band of fans um, led by third base saloon owner Mike McGreevy. With nearly 16,000 fans packed into Huntington Avenue grounds, the Rooters made a ruckus, most notably singing in unity, Tessie, a song that was made popular from the 1902 Broadway musical The Silver Slipper. Since the outcome was in Boston's favor, uh, people began to believe that perhaps they were a lucky charm. And for the next 15 years, the Royal Rooters showed up in rowdy form and sang the song at every game. They also traveled to the away games as well. And it got to the point where um, sometimes the team owners wouldn't let the game begin until the Rooters had arrived. Wow. And maybe the song really was the lucky charm that some thought it to be because <coughs> after the 1918 World Series, the Rooters stopped due to a combination of uh, aging and the, the ruckus and that kind of thing wasn't nearly as popular as it had been, the rowdiness as it had been in the early days. Um, so 1918 was kind of one of their, the, about their last year. And the soft string of World Series dried up at about that time. However, a local band named the Dropkick Murphys did a remix of the song in 2004, and wouldn't you know, that was the year the Sox won the first series since 1918, so maybe there was something behind it. What was the song again? Tessie. Tessie. Can you sing a few bars? I can't. I am going to, I'm going to sing later on, I promise you, but not Tessie. Um, <laughs> Boston Globe owner General Charles Taylor, um, a Civil War veteran, bought the team for his son in 1904, his son John. That year, the Bo Boston took home their second pennant, and, but that was 1904, 
and the manager of the National League champions, the New York Giants, refused to face off against the American League pennant winners. Uh, a couple of reasons. One was that initially he thought that it was quite possible that the American League Highlanders, the team in his own backyard, were likely going to win, and he didn't want to lend credence to this upstart team in his own backyard. Uh, he also said that, um, de facto, the National League was superior to the American League, and therefore they already were the champions because they were better than the American League. However, there was a huge public outcry about this, and so immediately thereafter, the um, two leagues sat down uh, and put together a plan for annual postseason championship playoffs. In 1906, just three years after winning the first ever uh, World Series, they came crashing down to last place. In 1907, a new team name was adopted, inspired by the Boston Red Sox stockings, which was the original name of the National League Boston uh, team of the Boston Braves. And they had brought that name with them from Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, um, back in the uh, later eight, or the 1880s. However, the name change didn't improve their luck at all. And through 1911, they never made better than third place. In 1912, John Taylor built a stadium on his own land and dubbed it Fenway Park because it was in the Fenway section of Boston. After two rain delays, Fenway Park finally hosted the first professional baseball game on April 20th, 1912, where the Red Sox defeated the New York Highlanders, later known as the Yankees, before 27,000 fans. And by, but by the way, the first official game had happened 11 days earlier on April 9th, when the Sox beat Harvard University. The Red Sox went on that year to win the American League pennant, and their opponent in the World Series uh, was the same New York Giants that had refused to play them in 1904. Uh, the contest went to eight games, and then a tenth inning uh, where they tied, were tied one to one. And then with a sacrifice fly by Larry Gardner, the Sox became the world champions once again. Now, even after the Sox made their home, uh, at Fenway. They didn't always play all their games at Fenway. Occasionally for some of the bigger games, they still played at Braves Field to uh, encourage or to allow for crowds that could swell to as many as uh, 42,000, uh, mm -hmm. such as for the games three and four in the 1915 World Series. Boston won, year, uh, won that year too, filling, beating the Philadelphia Phillies. The biggest baseball crowds uh, in um, Fenway were in the area of 47,000 for the Detroit Tigers uh, doubleheader and in 1934, and also that same year, uh, a game uh, with the New York Yankees where everybody was to bid farewell to Babe Ruth. Uh, but after World War II, more stringent fire laws and also league rules uh, prevented that kind of over. Crowding uh, that they saw that they that was allowed in the 1930s. In 1914, the Red Sox purchased the contract of Babe Ruth for eight thousand dollars from the Baltimore Orioles. The Orioles had discovered discovered Ruth uh, at the St. Mary School for Wayward Boys. <laughs> he hit with tremendous power. He was an able outfielder and uh, he threw with terrific velocity. So he was just a, a terrific all-around baseball package. And that year, the, fin the uh, Sox finished in second place. With Babe Ruth in his first full season, the Red Sox took the pennant and went on to face the Philadelphia Phillies. They, won the, they again won the championship, and in 1916, they went on to become the first team to win the World Series four times. They did it again in 1918, as we know, but I don't think anybody then could have known <laughs> that that would be the last championship in the 20th century. That was the fifth, the fifth one? Yes. Yep. In 1920, the, the Bambino's Red Sox career came to a sudden and shocking end 
when Red Sox owner and Broadway producer Harry Frazee sold the babe to New York for $100,000. The sale was reportedly made so that Frazee could um, fund a show that he was working on, uh, most likely uh, tied in some, to, in some way to his uh, fiance, those women. The sale was reportedly made, um, but prior to Ruth leaving Boston, just as an aside, the Red Sox had won five World Series, where New York had never even made it to a World Series. Now, unfortunately, but uh, almost from the beginning, bribery and scandal and gamblings and, and such plagued professional baseball. There were any number of uh, events that can be pointed to. In 1877, way back at the very beginning, players from the Louisville Graves, the National League, were, uh, were accused of and found to have thrown games in exchange for bribes from gamblers. And they were barred from the game. In 1908, an umpire reported that uh, somebody had attempted to bribe him to ensure that the New York Giants became the National League champions. And there were many more things like this, but it all came to a head in 1919 in what became known as the Black Sox scandal, mm -hmm. when eight players from the Chicago White Sox were accused of throwing the series against the Cincinnati Reds. They were banned from baseball for life, and the first baseball commissioner, Kennesaw Landis, was appointed to prevent further gambling and bribery scandals and to get to, to check and, and to get this in hand. What year was that again? 1919. The 1920s also saw the end of what was known as the dead ball era, when hits and home runs um, were less common and the game depended more on stealing bases and on bunting and such. A number of reasons for the dead ball era have been put forth and probably the, it's a combination in the end that really brought these about. Ballpark dimensions were larger so it was harder to hit a home run. Um, the balls were you know, of an older technology, so to speak. They were not as hard. Um, also, baseball clubs needed to save money. So balls were used again and again and again in the game. And then on top of that, um, fouls originally were not counted as strikes. Um, and when that rule was changed so that the, um, foul, the, first, the, the fouls could be the first two strikes, that made hitters much more cautious about what they were going to hit. Um, so kind of a combination of things brought, uh, led, about, led that to that. Pitchers also learned that spitting or scuffing the ball gave an unpredictability to its flight, making it more difficult um, to hit. And they sometimes even employed tactics of spitting tobacco juice on mm -hmm. the ball, kind of making it all grungy and dirty so that it was difficult to see. While technically this was against the rules, nobody really enforced the rules all that um, actively. And of course, failing to change the balls frequently just added to the problem. But in 1920, Cleveland shortstop Ray Sh Chapman was killed by a pitch. And an investigation into that uh, determined that he probably could not see the ball uh, as it was coming towards him uh, before it hit him. So this led to the banning of spitballs and other ball tampering tactics. It also required then that balls be changed out more frequently. At the same time, ball manufacturing uh, techniques were improving as well. Balls were getting harder. And so for a number of reasons, um, the dimensions on some, on some um, parks were uh, changed to some degree. So a lot of things came together to make it so that, and obviously they wanted they wanted more hits and more runs because that's what makes a baseball game more exciting. Nobody wants to go and see, that's there, therein lies the name dead ball. Nobody wants to see dead ball. 1931 was the first year that the Red Sox players wore numbers on their uniforms. The Sox have retired seven numbers since then and Major League Baseball retired number 42 of Jackie Robinson. Um, on the 50th anniversary of him breaking into the, uh, in, uh, breaking the color barrier. Sometimes, some teams don't retire numbers, and some teams don't formally retire uh, numbers, but 
simply take them out of circulation. On July 3rd, 1932, the Red Sox played the uh, game's first Sunday game uh, at Fenway, a 13-2 loss to the Yankees. Now, Sunday baseball had been approved three years earlier. However, Fenway's proximity um, to a church uh, precluded them being able to play their Sunday games at Fenway, and therefore they played um, those uh, at um, Braves Field on Com, Com Ave. In 1933, at age 30, Tom Yockey took the reins of the struggling Sox with the desire to guide them back onto the winning path. He undertook to rebuild the team, bringing on such um, heavy hitters and, and, and uh, high-powered players as Lefty Grove and Jimmy Fox. And, and Yockey was very clear about his aim and, and, and uh, stated right up, he wanted to beat the Yankees. Uh, but despite... His, the new talent that he was bringing in, the, stop, the Sox can, uh, continued to struggle. In 1939, Ted Williams made a big splash in his rookie season, smashing 31 homers and driving in 145 RBI. However, the Sox still fell short yet again uh, in the quest for the pennant. And they came in second, uh, for, the second for the second year in a row. In the 1941, Ted Williams came in, went into the last day of the season with a 3996 average, which just officially rounded up to 400. And people figured that since the Sox were out of any postseason play anyways, that he wasn't even going to play. But, you know, he did. He went in and he played both games and he pushed, his, um, he pushed himself up to 406. So that, he was a he was devoted and dedicated player. In January of 1942, the baseball commissioner, Kennesaw Landis, wrote to President Roosevelt, asking him if he thought that the um, Major League Baseball season should progress, given World War II. And Roosevelt wrote back in what has been um, come to be known as the Green Light Letter, which is pictured here. Roosevelt wrote that he didn't feel that he could give an official um, response to this, and that the baseball officials should really be the people making the decision on that score. But he did say that on a personal note, that he thought that Major League Baseball provided entertainment for a population that needed it, for people who were working hard and dedicating themselves to the war effort. And so the season did go on. However, accommodations did have to be made for um, the wartime, wartime circumstances. For example, 1942 All-Star Game. It was lucky that the final out at the bottom of the ninth just beat, beat the East, uh, East Coast War Curfew because otherwise the game would have been closed, called. The war did, however, dramatically change the playing field, so to speak. Following the 1942 season, Ted Williams enlisted, joining an impressive list of all-stars who would be absent from baseball fighting in Europe and in the Pacific. Now, Major League Baseball games um, continued. I mean, there were people who were not uh, able to enlist, some older players as well. Um, but some of the minor leagues were forced to shut down from lack of young talent coming through. And this really called into question the future of Major League Baseball. To maintain baseball's popularity then and to keep people coming to the stadiums, uh, Chewing Gum Mogul and Chicago Cubs owner Philip uh, Wrigley came up with the idea. He established the All-American Girls Baseball League in 1943. It was comprised of several franchises um, located in the Midwest. Potential players went through a formal recruitment through um, screening and a training process uh, before being added to the roster. It was a very rigorous um, process. In addition to baseball skills, the players were instructed on deportment, appearance, and makeup during charm school sessions in the evening. Just like the men. <laughs> you know, they wanted, they, they wanted the ideal of the all-around, you know, athletic, but, you know, and healthy, and you know, ladylike. 
the whole thing. They, they wanted to mm -hmm. um, Im imbue their players with that. In the smaller cities where they started out, they drew substantial crowds. At the start of each game, players from um, each team would uh, line up, as you see here, mm -hmm. uh, to form a V for a victory for the World War II effort. However, by 1944, it, it had become clear that Major League Baseball was not going to be in any imminent danger, and Wrigley withdrew his interest and his support. The teams continued on, uh, but the new teams in larger towns like Milwaukee, or cities like Milwaukee and Minneapolis, just didn't draw the same sort of crowds. Um, they didn't get the same kind of media attention. Uh, there was more, m many more forms of entertainment in those larger cities, and so they really failed to take hold. And later on, uh, with the advent of televised Major League Baseball, and again, more and more alternative entertainments, attendance continued to drop, and the league disbanded in 1954. Now, going back to Williams, without his assistance, the Sox struggled. In 1946, when he returned from flying combat missions in the Pacific, the Red Sox cruised to their first American League pennant in something like 28 years. And they went on, they were heavily favored to win against the St. Louis Cardinals that year. However, the Cardinals managed to completely shut Williams out, and he did not appear in another World Series uh, prior to his retirement. In 1947, lights were installed at Fenway Park, making the Red Sox the third to last team to, uh, to add lights to their ballpark. The same year, the green, uh, green paint replaced the advertisements, setting the stage for the nickname The Green Monster. And Red Sox uh, were first uh, televised on WBZ-TV in um, May of 1948. In 1947, Jackie Robinson became the first American to play in the major leagues when he signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Red Sox dragged their feet on this issue for a long time to the detriment of the team's performance. Um, they, had chance, they had a chance to uh, scout um, Jackie Robinson, they had a ch chance to go and scout uh, Willie Mays, but just declined to act. They just didn't do it. They were the last team to embrace integration when they signed Pumsy Green in 1959. And speaking of this, I want to talk just a little bit about the evolution of black baseball as it relates to the history we've been talking about. I mean, obviously, this is a whole conversation unto itself um, with, a, with a rich and wonderful history. But just want to talk a little bit about it because, of course, this is where um, a lot of the players came from that eventually you know, started to play with the advent of integration. After the Civil War, some of the teams that were forming in did include actually African-American players. There was no um, segregation at that time. And even in the National Association of Baseball Players, um, they banned black players, but black players continued to play in some of the minor leagues and other leagues. However, by the 1890s, um, there was an informal agreement among many, most of the franchises, uh, banning black players. And this really took hold um, with the formation of what we think of as the modern leagues. Beginning in the 1880s, there were over 200 all-black teams uh, formed. And by the end of World War I, baseball was one of the premier entertainments for the African-American population, uh, the urban and the African-American population. In 1920, the Negro National League and the Negro Southern League were formed, and the Eastern Colored League uh, formed uh, three years later. Now, while some of these leagues dissolved and came about again um, over time, they, the uh, Colored Leagues continued on uh, even through the um, Depression and were a very vibrant uh, and rich source of entertainment. But after World War II, as integration opened the door for many black players, uh, they began to migrate over to the ma major leagues, and um, the African American leagues began to lose both players and spectators, and the last um, league dissolved in the early 60s. Now a bit more about the curse of the Bambino. Even though Babe Ruth had been sold to the Yankees way back in 1920, 
Prior to 1986, there were only occasional references to, oh, geez, it seems like there's some kind of a curse on the, the Red Sox. Um, and then nothing more specific was said. But after the Red Sox collapsed in Game uh, 7, uh, get, uh, game six of the uh, 1986 World Series, a New York Times sports writer wrote an article connecting both the tragedies of that game as well as all the misfortunes that had been plagued, uh, that had been plaguing uh, the, the Red Sox, um, and tied this all to perhaps the sale of Babe Ruth. And then when they lost game seven, and as well the series, he wrote another article expanding on the theme, headlined Babe Ruth's Curse strikes again. These articles were the first real explicit mentions in print of a Babe Ruth specific curse. Another sports writer had written that when the Red Sox traded Babe Ruth to the Yankees, he carried away with him the good luck and winning touch of the Red Sox. After 1986, with the world championship drought stretching on and on and on, more and more references were made um, within the media concerning this curse. And Red Sox fans have attempted various methods over the years to exercise this silent curse. These methods have been varied and, and um, very colorful, uh, including pl placing a Red Sox cap at the top of Mount Everest and burning a Yankees cap at the base camp of Mount Everest, <laughs> um, and hiring a professional exorcist to purify Fenway Park. Some declared the curse was broken when in July of 2004, a foul ball pitched by Manny Ramirez um, hit a boy in the face and knocked out his two, two of his teeth. Well, it turned out that the boy lived in the old farmhouse that had once been owned by Babe Ruth. And that same day, the Yankees suffered their worst ever clobbering, 22 to zero, against the Cleveland Indians. But as we all know, the curse, if such a thing there was, was finally and truly broken later that year. Maybe it was the two front teeth, maybe it was the exorcism, or maybe it was the drop kick Murphys. <laughs> Remake of the song, Tessie, I guess we will never know. In May of 1908, lyricist Jack Norworth and composer um, Albert von Tilzer applied for copyright to the song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. The song is about a girl named Katie Casey, who, when her beau offers to take her to a show, instead asks him to take me out to the ball game, take me out with the crowd, buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack, I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes. They're out at the old ball game. Very good. It became an instant hit and was sung not only at baseball games, but also in vaudeville sh shows of the time. It's said to be one of the top 10 most recognizable songs up there with Happy Birthday and the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> and speaking of instant hits and Cracker Jacks, this tasty treat was introduced uh, to much acclaim at the 1893 World's Fair. And it became forever linked to baseball through the lyrics of that song, which furthered its popularity. Uh, Cracker Jacks at one time featured baseball cards like the ones pictured here with the slogan, Cracker Jack Ball Players. And moving on to baseball cards. Right before the Civil War, what, um, the first version of what we might think of as baseball cards was introduced, um, became popular. Uh, they featured a picture of a photo of a player or a team adhered to, uh, to cardboard. There was a larger side, size, and those were called cabinet cards. They were meant for display. And then there were also smaller cards, and those were called Carta de Vista. Um, these cards did not promote any particular company. In the 1860s, a sporting goods company came up with the idea of having a card with a, um, a photo of the player on one side and then their advertisement uh, on the back. 
Um, these were called trade cards. They were handed out for free. You weren't, you weren't required to buy a product in order to get them. And then in the 1880s, cards began to be included with cigarettes, as in this old judge card that you see here. Many tobacco uh, companies took up this practice, but later with the consolidation of um, the tobacco companies and kind of the uh, loss of competition, tobacco companies for a time uh, discontinued doing this, but the government came in, deregulated uh, the tobacco companies, uh, increased the competition back up, and the practice uh, was reinvigorated. Uh, and at that point, uh, candy companies also joined in and began to introduce cards as well. In the 1920s, tobacco companies discontinued this um, practice for good, but candy and gum companies continued on. And as a matter of fact, some of these cards today can be worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So, run up to your attic, down to your basement, call your great grandmother, look for those cards because you could really be sitting on a gold mine. Before what year? Okay. Um, what was the last it, year? Anything, in, especially in the 1800s or early 1900s, but it kind of depends upon um, the player. You know, it's like most things, it's hard. You, know, you, see one, you, you see one and you see another and they're still in the same year and one's incredibly valuable and one's not worth that much. Um, but if you find one, go online and you know, see if, the, if you can find something else about uh, to see if there's a comparable one on, on sale. They're not as worth as much now as they were 10, 15 years ago. Lots of things aren't, unfortunately. <laughs> the market dropped because yeah. just recently there was a big auction mm -hmm. of, of some baseball cards that somebody found in their attic mm -hmm. from the, or their grandparents or something, and they thought they were going to get a lot more money for them than what they did. Mm. I read before 1980 were valuable, after 1980. I just read that. It depends on who they are. Right, and I mean, more recent ones, but I'm, I'm thinking actually of some of these, you know, really, really, really old, old ones. Yeah. Yeah. And now for a little uh, local history. Groveland has made its own contributions to Major, Major League Baseball. Uh, and perhaps uh, you, you know more about this than I do, but Jim McGinley, pictured on the left, was born in Groveland in 1878. And he pitched for the St. Louis Cardinals in 04 and, uh, 1904 and 1905. And he's actually buried here uh, at the Riverview Cemetery in Groveland. Cy Twombly, pictured on the right, mm -hmm. was born in 1897 and joined the uh, Chicago White Sox in 1921. Neither player enjoyed a long career in baseball, but it is interesting to note that both were pitchers. So I'm wondering if it's something in the water here. <laughs> <laughs> And so, as we've seen, baseball has evolved in so many ways, from strictly amateur play to expansive professional league, from hometown games on a Saturday afternoon to a nationwide major league schedule that is simply dizzying, from a loose and changing set of rules to standards strictly set down by a governing body. And yet, if you drive through any town on a sunny afternoon, you're likely to catch a baseball game in action perhaps little leaguers battling it out on the field, or recreational ball, ball players like those in the Concord Sun, Sunset League, which is actually um, one of the oldest leagues still in existence. And maybe if you're really lucky, as we were talking about earlier, you'll catch a vintage baseball game, or showing the crowd how it used to be done. But no matter how you enjoy the game, in every way, baseball is an integral part of our national identity, and it really looks as though it's gonna stay that way. Thank you. And now, I have just a little trivia, <laughs> and I've got prizes. <laughs> I loved these. I found these, I, um, I was so excited when I found these because they looked so vintage. I just thought those, that was awesome. Like Cracker Barrel, right? Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel. No, Cracker Barrel. Oh, oh um, yeah. you know what? I actually bought these on Vinyl Haven Island off the coast of Maine. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Maybe they so these are imported. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I think Vermont Country Store probably has them. Too. Probably, yeah. I mean, I bought, I bought, I actually, Cracker Jack now comes in um, bags. Yes. Uh, and I use those for one of my presentations. And that's great because you can, 
um, toss them into the audience to the winners, and I don't want to hurt anybody with <laughs> these. <laughs> they just can toss the boxes at the baseball. I know. Well, I might try that tonight. I don't know. I'll I'll see. You know, who who I'll see if everybody looks like they're really good catchers. <laughs> So, okay, so everybody ready? Eyes on the screen, because uh, the first person to answer um, gets, uh, gets the prize. So, first question is, Seven. Uh, I think you got it. And you look like you can. <laughs> All righty. Three more chances. Which stadium is the second oldest? Mm -hmm. I know that stadium. I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. You're talking. You're talking current Major League stadiums, I assume. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wrigley Field. Good job. Wow, this, this, this side's killing them. <laughs> Guys, get it again. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're definitely some in there. I hope. Oh. <laughs> I bought them with the understanding that they weren't just empty boxes. <laughs> they still size in there. Yes, there are, I think. Okay, next question. Yeah, you have to go way back. Oh, actually, okay. the okay. rules are different now, and so I think it's pretty much impossible to even hit it anymore. Yeah. Yep, Cy Young. Yeah. <laughs> How much do you like this? <laughs> okay, and the last question, and it was seven thousand three hundred and fifty-five. Wow. Which, which um, is just, I guess, not possible. It just the way things work in, in modern baseball. It's he had over um, he had over eight hundred decisions. He won five hundred and eleven games and lost three hundred and something. So I mean, you know, it's absolutely phenomenal. Okay, now moving ahead to more recent history. Yes, got it. All right. Many. There we How go. soon they forget. <laughs> <laughs> and that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.